In the history of games using dice, there are many that reward high rolling, or at least rare rolling. This includes Monopoly with its limited roll again on a double, Backgammon's double moves on a double throw, Craps triple on boxcars, Ludo's roll again on a six and so on. In war games and other games that have tabulated results, the best results, often resulting in the destruction or routing of an enemy unit, are achieved on high rolls. In many ways, the prevalence of something beneficial occurring on the highest die result possible for a game has led to the expectation that, if a game uses dice, then high rolls must be rewarded. When Dungeons & Dragons was first introduced in 1974, no such special results existed within Chainmail or the alternative combat system for rolling high, other than the improved chance of eliminating your foe from the fight by successfully hitting them. But over the years, many people have introduced the concept of special results for high rolling, particularly in the form of critical hits. Unofficial critical hit and fumble systems were published in the pages of magazines such as Dragon, and eventually, within Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd edition, critical hits became officially recognised within the core rulebooks as an optional rule. From 3rd edition on, criticals have been a part of the game's default rules. But I would argue that this is more symptomatic of treating the game as a game, of doing what so many board games do in rewarding high rolls as part of the game of rolling dice, rather than any simulationist attempt at depicting lucky blows. What I'm hopefully going to show in this video is why I don't think criticals work, for me, within the context of Dungeons & Dragons, and what games they do work for and why. This is meant as a piece to give you food for thought on the subject, and not to say anything like, you're doing it wrong to people that use criticals within their Dungeons & Dragons games and enjoy them. For the record, I lean more towards a simulationist approach in my role-playing. For the purpose of the discussion, I'm going to compare 1st edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, RuneQuest, role-playing in Glorantha, and Rollmaster Classic. Three of these games, 5e, RuneQuest and Rollmaster, have criticals as part of their core system. One of them, AD&D 1st Edition, does not, and where criticals were used, they were house rules or rules adopted from magazine articles and other third-party sources. First, we need to consider what defines an attack within each game. That is, when you are rolling dice to see if you successfully damage a foe, what is that dice roll representing? Across the four games, we have three answers to this. In AD&D and 5e, an attack roll, made by rolling a 20-sided dice, represents a number of feints and manoeuvres aimed at to, to reduce a target's ability to stay in the fight. The attack roll does not refer to a single blow with a weapon, and as a resultant hit does not mean that a combatant has been injured. In RuneQuest, the attack roll is made using percentile dice, and it does represent an attempt to physically injure an opponent. A successful hit may result in the target being injured. In Rollmaster, the attack roll is a percentile roll and combines the two philosophies previously described. Both the wearing of an opponent down and the capacity to injure are reflected in the system. So that's the attack roll. How about the attack roll's opposition, the target's defences, usually comprising armour and the ability to avoid an attacker's efforts? Here we have four distinct answers. For AD&D, armour is described as having a base armour class. The lower the numerical value, the more protective that armour is. Different weapons are more or less effective against different types of armour, as reflected in the modifiers to hit versus armour type by weapon. On top of that is the target's ability to manoeuvre themselves defensively within combat, which is represented by a modifier to armour class based on the target's dexterity. Net arm class, therefore, represents a target's protective rating through armour and the target's ability to avoid attacks and dictates a to-hit modifier depending on the weapon used by the attacker. 5e inherits some of these elements. Base armour class is determined by armour worn, but in this case the higher value represents the more protective armours. Armour class is similarly adjusted due to dexterity, the adjustment is better than in AD&D, but is also limited by an armour type's bulkiness. Armour doesn't care what type of weapon are used against it, and weapons don't care what type of armour they're being used against. There is no adjustment for armour type versus weapon type. 
In RuneQuest, armour is rated in terms of the amount of damage it can prevent, armour points that are subtracted from incoming damage. Damage that gets through can also damage armour, as represented by a reduction in the armour points it provides until repaired. To represent a target's ability to avoid incoming attacks, targets have the ability to dodge or to parry if they have enough activity remaining to do so. This means that a target's dexterity does not adjust an attacker's attack roll, nor does it increase an equivalent to armour class, but provides the target with some proactive means to avoid blows altogether. Both dodging and parrying require percentile checks against the target's ability to dodge or parry to successfully perform the action. In some cases, parrying with a weapon or shield may cause that weapon or shield to become damaged. For Rollmaster, armour is rated by type. Numerically, but each number refers to a defined category of armour configuration from simple robes to full plate. To represent both the target's facility to parry and their ability to dodge, targets have a defensive bonus. In converse, an attacker has an offensive bonus. Part of a target's offensive bonus can be shifted into defensive bonus to represent parrying, essentially reducing the chances of successfully attacking in favour of boosting the chance to successfully parry. The remainder of a target's defensive bonus comes from their agility, which is equivalent to dexterity, armour quality and so on. The attack roll comprises a percentile roll, with the attacker's offensive bonus added, the target's defensive bonus subtracted, and the result then compared to the armour type worn by the target. The result may be numerical, representative of concussion hit loss, which is parallel to D&D's hit point loss, and or lettered. The letters represent criticals of five different severities, A through to E, the results of which are usually indicative of specific injury. Now on to how damage is recorded in each game and what the numbers refer to there. In AD&D and 5e, damage is recorded against hit points. Hit points represent a target's ability to stay in the fight, whether by luck, determination, heroism and, ultimately, injury. Foes wear each other's ability to fight down until such time one is reduced to zero hit points, at which point they are incapacitated. AD&D also allows for negative hit points to be recorded while incapacitated until death occurs at minus 10 hit points. 5e does away with negative recording of hit points in favour of death saves, made round by round. Three such failed saves result in the character dying. In both games, hit points rise as a character becomes more adept, more heroic, more favoured by the gods, whatever, and therefore able to go longer into a fight before becoming incapacitated. RuneQuest considers hit points to be mostly physical representation of damage, or rather the capacity of a combatant to absorb damage. Both a single pool of hit points representing net shock to the system through injury, and separate pools per damage location – head, chest, abdomen, arms and legs – are recorded. Negative hit points within a location are indicative of crippling injuries, or even total loss of a body part. Generally, hit points do not rise. RuneQuest does not use level advancement, until the physical factors that affect damage absorption capability, mainly constitution and the character's size, improve. Heroics, luck and deity favouritism are measured in different ways. Skill, for example. Rollmaster's equivalent to hit points are concussion hits, and they measure just that. Loss of concussion hits brings a target closer to being incapacitated, but it is rare that a combatant dies from concussion hit loss alone. Weapon damage is inflicted against concussion hits, but far more important are the critical results themselves, which we'll get onto in a bit. Concussion hits improve through the progression of a body development skill, which a character has the opportunity to do so each time they acquire a new level. Yes, Rollmaster uses a level progression system. Now for criticals and what they represent. AD&D has no criticals, but it was common to allow a 20 to inflict a critical, usually something as simple as applying double damage. 5e applies this simplistic and egregious, as I'll explain in a bit, model 2, with a 20 being an automatic hit and a critical, regardless of the armour class target required. Sometimes a roll of 1 is used to represent a fumble. In 5e, a roll of 1 simply indicates an automatic miss. RuneQuest uses a sliding scale to determine whether a critical or a lesser critical effect the game names as special success has been achieved. 
Criticals are scored on a percentile roll that falls within 5% of the attacker's base chance. So, for example, an attacker with a 40% weapon skill would score a critical on a roll of 1 or 2 on percentile dice, 5% of 40 being 2. A special success is scored at 20% of that, so for our 40% skill attacker, that would be on a roll of 3 to 8. A fumble is scored on the upper result, representing 5% of the attacker's skill. So for our 40% skill attacker, that is a roll of 99 or 100. All this means that the attacker's chance to achieve a critical, a special, a success, a failure or a fumble is based on the skill he possesses with the weapon being used. Rollmaster similarly resolves using percentile dice with the attacker's net offensive bonus added. A good chunk of offensive bonus comes from his skill with the weapon in hand. The higher the resulting roll, the more likely it is to achieve a critical result on the attack table for the weapon being used. Obviously then, frequency of scoring criticals increases with weapon skill. Fumbles in Rollmaster are determined by weapon type. Each weapon type has a fumble range. And if the unmodified attack dice roll, i.e. before offensive bonus is applied, falls within to this range, then a fumble might occur. One popular article from Dragon Magazine that addressed criticals and fumbles within Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was Good Hits and Bad Misses by Carl Palagreco from issues 39 in July 1980. In it, Carl addresses the major issue that existed within the common house ruling of one being a fumble and twenty being a critical, and seeks to address it. I'll explain the issue with a few additions beyond those highlighted in Carl's article. A twenty-sided dice obviously has twenty possible outcomes, ignoring bonuses and penalties for the time being. This translates there to there being a 5% probability of rolling any given result. Need a 15, 5% chance. Need an 8, 5% chance. Need a 20, 5% chance. The really simple method of calculating the probability of achieving a set number or higher, as needed within 3rd edition onwards with difficulty class and armour class, and 2nd edition and earlier with target numbers calculated from to hit armour class 0 or table cross-reference, is to multiply the number of results that would create a success by 5. For example, need a 17 or higher? Four possible dice rolls will give you that, a 17, 18, 19 and 20, and therefore you have a 20% chance of success. Hopefully you understand that, because it's an important thing going forwards. So let's take a house rule for AD&D and 5e's current auto-miss on a 1 and auto-hit uh, plus critical on a 20, and compare that with what passes for weapon skill in both games. That is the improvement in probability to, give, uh, to hit a given armour class level by level. For a 6th level character, taking an average armour class of 5, or 15 in 5e terms, in 1st edition a cleric would have a 40% chance of hitting it, a thief and a magic user would have a 35% chance, and a fighter a 50% chance. For 5e, the chance is the same across the board. Ignoring ability bonuses, a 6th level character has a plus 3 proficiency bonus and therefore needs to roll a 12 or higher to hit an armour class of 15, a 45% chance. Obviously, feats, subclass capabilities, ability bonuses, etc. make the difference here over the older edition's target numbers by class and level. At first level, an ad and the probabilities are 25% for magic users and thieves, 30% for fighters and clerics, and for 5e it's 35% chance across the board from a plus one proficiency bonus. But what is the chance for a sixth level and a first level character to achieve a fumble or a critical? 5%. For each, across the board, at both level markers, first and sixth, in both games, assuming the common simple house rule for AD and D. You could be a first level wizard or a twentieth level heroic warrior. Your chance to score a critical is the same, five percent. Within a game such as Ludo, this is fine. Your critical is getting to roll again, and therefore having a better chance at getting ahead of your opponents in the race to get your pieces home. In a role playing game that at least has some pretense at simulation, I find this unacceptable. Your skill at arms neither mitigates your chance to fumble, or just automatically miss, nor improves your chance to score a critical. In the Dragon article, Carl puts forward a better proposition, which uses the margin of success, the difference between the net attack result and the target required. That's used as a percentage to determine whether a critical has been scored, or a fumble. 
If the attack missed, the difference is used as a percentage to determine whether a fumble was suffered. Regardless of how you determine the effects of a critical or fumble, it could be double damage, whatever, and Carl's article assembles tables similar to the ones put forward by RuneQuest and Rollmaster to paint detailed results, this percentile system is far better, as it takes into account the skill of the combatant. A low-level magic user has a large margin by which they can fail, and a smaller margin by which they can succeed. Now, to put into the determination of critical and fumble percentages than a 10th level fighter. This is more sensible. As we pointed out, both RuneQuest and Rollmaster already take skill at arms into account. Percentiles to score criticals and fumbles are a product of combatant skill in RuneQuest, and the higher one's offensive bonus is in Rollmaster, the better one's chances of reaching the more lethal extents of the combat tables. However, weapon skill in Rollmaster does not go so far into mitigating fumbles. As we've noted, that's the unmodified dice roll range for a weapon, rather than a component of character skill. A special success in RuneQuest inflicts additional damage and possible special conditions according to the type of weapon used. Impaling weapons inflict impales, slashing weapons inflict slashes and so on. A critical inflicts maximum damage possible for the special result and ignores armour, so damage is not reduced by armour points available to the body location struck. In this way, criticals in RuneQuest can be very deadly indeed. A critical in Rollmaster is, as we said, uh, representative of specific damage. This might be bleeding wounds or stuns or broken bones, all the way up to instant death effects such as decapitation. The broad concept in Rollmaster is that a combatant is more likely to die from critical hits than concussion hit loss, and criticals are far more common, at least at the low level of severity, than they are in the other three games. Now, if I may, I'd like to go back and revisit Advanced Dungeons and Dragons before I go on to some concluding analysis. Within the pages of the Dungeon Master's Guide, Gary Gygax specifically warns against introducing complexity and calls out criticals, hit locations and double damage routines in particular. In fact, given that RuneQuest includes all of these elements that Gygax warns against, as well as being the up-and-coming competitor to Dungeons & Dragons at the time the Dungeon Master's Guide was written, one might assume that he is targeting that game in all but name. But whatever the reasoning, the primary element that Gygax recognises is the inappropriateness of such elements in combat within the scope of the Dungeons & Dragons rules – And he goes on beyond, although I will disagree with him there, but will wait for my conclusion to cover why. But this aspect seems to have been forgotten by the numerous house rulers who introduced criticals into their games, the authors of 2nd edition who followed suit by adding it as an option, and the authors of 3rd edition who built criticals into the core game. The D&D rules abstract so many elements of combat, including injury, healing, defence, attack, damage, armour, weapon effectiveness and so on, that attempting to shoehorn or tack on attempts at realism are doomed to failure. But if you are introducing criticals not as such a futile mission, but rather as a high-rolling reward part of the game, that sits better with me, but it still denies the core balance in the underlying system, and that hasn't changed all that much in its 50-year history. One thing that has changed, that does offer a saving grace towards criticals in some form, is the elimination of what I call the 20 plateau that exists in 1st edition, Moldve Basic and Beckme versions of the game. This is simply those areas of the combat matrices where 20s appear concurrently, both vertically by armour class and horizontally by attacker level. For example, a fighter of 1st through 6th level requires a 20 to hit armour class minus 5, and a 1st level character will hit armour class minus 5 through to 0. This despite the general improvements of to hit targets for fighters being 2 per 2 levels as opposed to 1 per level in later editions. This lends significance to a net roll of 20. The target number decreasing by level is arrested at the horizontal portion of the plateau, but also the increase in target number according to low armour class is also arrested at a certain point. You are rewarded by rolling a total attack roll of 20 by it having a greater impression on the attack tables than any other dice result. Anyway, let's reach some conclusions. I'm going to put some statements down that highlight the detail for each of the four systems under scrutiny provided. 
and why criticals and fumbles do or do not work particularly well, in my opinion. Bear in mind, when we go through these, that I am a simulationist when it comes to role-playing, seeing abstractions uh, more of a holdover of wargaming, and in fact, I use and enjoy abstractions in the war games that I play. So, attack. AD&D and 5e, an attack represents numerous manoeuvres. Ringquest and Rollmaster, an attack represents a single attempt to harm with a weapon. Defence. AD&D and 5e, armour class, abstracts both defensive quality of armour and ability to avoid attacks. Runequest. Armour points represent ability of armour to prevent injury, while dodge and parry skills represent ability to avoid attacks. Rollmaster. Armour type is cross-referenced by weapon and attack roll to determine effectiveness of armour and skill against attack type. One attack roll is made, which is adjusted by a target's ability to avoid attacks, as represented by their defensive bonus. A couple of points regarding specifics of defence that we haven't touched on, but I'll include here, as they help to illustrate my points. So, shields. In AD&D and 5e, shields improve armour class. Runequest. Shields can be used to parry, and have armour point capabilities when doing so. Rollmaster. Shields add to defensive bonus. Helmets. AD&D and 5e. It does not matter at all whether you wear a helmet or not, at least from a combat perspective. RuneQuest. Helmets provide armour points for the head. Rollmaster. Helmets mitigate the effects of certain critical hits and can turn a fatal head critical into a lesser effect. OK, so on to damage. AD&D and 5e. Damage represents a reduction in capacity to continue the fight. RuneQuest. Damage represents actual physical injury. Rollmaster. Damage re represents reduction in capacity to fight, which also produces a reduction in fighting capability. Something I didn't mention earlier. So with a percentage of concussion hits lost, you will start taking penalties to your offensive bonus and so on. Criticals. In AD&D, no critical system within the core rules. Optional systems such as double damage or uh, in second edition. 5e. Double damage dice and automatic hit on a natural 20, which gives a 5% across the board chance of scoring a critical. Ringquest. Maximum damage and ignore armour. Highly likely to result in death or incapacitation depending on weapon used. This scales with the character's weapon skill. Rollmaster. Criticals represent specific injuries from minor cuts to fatalities. So now we come to healing. So how do you restore yourself from injuries and hit point loss? Now AD&D, healing takes a relatively long time, natural healing that is, and represents recovery of fighting capacity. 5e, healing is available via short and long rests and represents recovery of fighting capacity, not necessarily recovering from injury, as that's not what hit points represent. And the same goes for AD&D. RuneQuest. Healing takes a relatively long time and requires care, as it represents recovery from injury. Rollmaster. Recovery from concussion hits requires moderate rest. Recovery from injuries inflicted via criticals often requires specific skills or magic. And that segues us into healing magic. In AD&D and 5e, cure wounds and related spells recover hit points. Very few spells relate to recovery from injury. Regenerate, for example, being an exception. RuneQuest. Magic is common. Healing magic, very much so. It represents recovery of hit points, which means specifically healing injuries. More severe injuries, where hit points in a location of drop below zero, are harder to heal and require more powerful healing magic. Rollmaster. Specific spells are available for specific injuries. Bone healing spells for broken bones, blood-related spells for bleeding and tissue damage, and so on. As you can see, the four sampled game systems handle this one element of the game, combat, in varying degrees of difference. This is not a problem. In fact, it's desirable that different games approach things in different ways, because in that way, variety is spawned, and a diverse amount of solutions to particular problems are created. Not all games appeal to everyone, and by having such a broad base of potential means that a broader base of players are attracted to our hobby. I know. Diversity and inclusion. Hey, who said it all needed to be about things like gender? Modifying games is also not an issue. 
As many role-playing rulebooks state, the rules are just guides. So house rule away. But when you are house ruling, a certain amount of understanding is needed as to what impact you intend your new rule to have and what it is actually representing. By design, Dungeons & Dragons is not meant to be realistic. It's a game. It always has been stated to be a game. Its designers specifically eschewed realism or attempts at simulation in favour of it being a game. When you use critical hits in Dungeons & Dragons, you are adding another game element to the game abstraction it uses. You are not adding anything approaching simulation. I hope I've shown that Rollmaster, and especially RuneQuest, at least within combat, do approach some level of simulation, but in doing so, virtually every aspect of their core, from skill development to how ability scores work, or their equivalent, and beyond, meshes with support for that simulation. To do critical hits and fumbles properly within D&D, you'd need to overhaul the way armour works, how weapons inflict damage, what hit points mean, what cure wound spells are doing, and so much more. 5e's automatic hit and double damage on a natural 20 buys in to the D&D is a game more than a simulation, and that's fine. Within the context of its core, it's not attempting to do anything else, and there's no attempt at justifying the rule by saying it represents anything other than an abstract game mechanic. But if you have a temptation to go all in with critical hit effects and fumbles as per good hits and bad misses and similar, I do urge you to stop a minute and think what you are ultimately trying to achieve. If it is to inject a more realistic approach into the game, you're barking up the wrong tree. I urge you to recall Gary Gygax's words on the subject. With complex combat systems which stress so-called realism and feature hit locations, special damage and so on, either this option is severely limited or the rules are highly slanted towards flavouring the player characters at the expense of their opponents. If you want heroic fantasy action, where heroes of preternatural might clobber larger-than-life villains, there are very few games better than Dungeons & Dragons, in any of its many incarnations. That is its bread and butter. But if you want a more simulationist, realistic, whatever that means within the context of a game, detailed approach to especially combat, don't reinvent the wheel. There are plenty of games out there that do just that, RuneQuest and Rollmaster being just two. In other words, if your desire is represented by a round hole, look for a round peg to fit it.